In the 2000s, a technologically minded South African set about creating a revolutionary electric car set to change the industry forever. And no, I am not talking about that potato shaped transphobic who ruined Twitter. No, I'm talking about a man called Kubus Meiring, whose invention set alight the international motoring industry in 2008, then set alight an enormous amount of funding trying to get it produced, and then the actual car got set alight 10 years later. A car that pioneered technology that most mass market cars are still trying to perfect today, and a car that was so revolutionary that it failed. Today, we are going to talk about optimal energy and its killer jewel. The 2000s were a pretty incredible time for South Africa. We were just coming off the Mandela presidency. Everyone was optimistic. We'd won the 2010 World Cup bid and everyone was really getting behind the idea of the rainbow nation. And in the middle of all of this was a man called Kubus Meiring. And he has one of the most unbelievable CVs I have ever seen. He made a name for himself by being part of the design team of the Roy Falk attack helicopter. Then he moved to the SALT, the South African Large Telescope. Pretty standard transition to make, I guess. Once he was done with being concerned about telescopes, he set his sights on creating a revolutionary electric vehicle. So he grabbed a bunch of engineers from the SALT project and in 2005 created Optimal Energy. Now, this idea was completely not unique in the 2000s. There were hundreds of startups and many, many, many OEMs looking towards the electric future, but Optimal Energy was going about it in a way that very few other companies were. Creating groundbreaking technology is unbelievably expensive, so most creators try to take a pre-existing internal combustion engine design and stuff electric motors and battery technology into that pre-existing design. Prime example of this is the Tesla Roadster, which was basically just a Lotus. The Roadster also exemplifies the second part of this sort of ideology, which is niche and low volume. The Roadster is a two-seater sports car which was designed to attract the interest of early adopters. It was unbelievably expensive and not very practical in a real way. Even the second car that Tesla created, which was the Model S, was a $100,000 four-door sedan. So you put the production costs on the niche very expensive early adopter cars. And then eventually once that is paid off and you've refined the technology, you start moving into mass market cars. Optimal Energy decided on a different approach because they looked at the way that we drive where vast majority of people are doing a lot of short commuting trips like going to work or going to school. And if it's not regular people commuting, it is short distance delivery drivers. If you can make that quiet, safe and efficient through electrification, you can make a real difference, not just for the drivers of the cars, but also people on the street and the environment. This pitch was enough for the South African government's Department of Science and Technology, and they gave an enormous amount of money to the project, along with private equity investment. The prototype was designed by South African designer Keith Heifert, who played a role in the creation of the Jaguar XJ220. Have you ever heard of it? With input from legendary design studio Zagato. Have you ever heard of it? They created a ground up space frame chassis, which was not reliant on any pre-existing design. Unfortunately, they took inspiration from the unbelievably ugly Fiat Multipler, but this did mean that the car was spacious inside and could incorporate six seats for mass people moving, but also meant that if you removed majority of the seats, you could turn the small car into a practical van. If you aren't impressed by the looks, the technology will genuinely amaze you because despite the fact that battery technology was not particularly impressive at the time, the car only weighed 1200 kilograms, which most EVs can't achieve today with 20 years of battery development. It had a 36 kilowatt hour battery, which claimed to get 300 kilometers of range. As we know, we should never take these things on face value, but reviewers at the time claimed that they could get 200 kilometers of range, which may not sound like a lot, but if you consider the mass market alternative to the Jewel at the time was the Nissan Leaf, which anecdotally could only get 80 kilometers of range, this is really impressive. It could also allegedly be charged in just seven hours from a wall plug, which is 
amazing because if you drive around the whole day, use up your 200 kilometers of range, which is probably quite unlikely. You come home, you park it in the garage, you plug it into the wall, you go to sleep, you wake up again the next morning, unplug it and it's fully charged. That's pretty ideal for the city driving that they were designing it for. Like all electric cars, it had instant torque from a 70 kilowatt motor and it had regenerative braking, which is standard technology now, but in 2005 to 2008, when this was being developed, would have been unheard of in a passenger car. There were even rumors it was gonna get a solar roof to charge things like the air conditioning and the cigarette lighters, meaning that the battery could be saved just for driving range. This is crazy, crazy technology for the time. With all this incredible development, you can see why the private investors, the creators, and the government were unbelievably excited about this car, but they were being realistic. They knew that this would have been incredibly expensive to produce, so they were gonna start hand-built low volume, maybe sell it to government agencies or something like that at the beginning, and then slowly ramp up the production once they'd paid off the production costs. This was a great idea, very mature, very demure, and it lasted all the way up until the 2008 Paris Motor Show. Sorry, Paris Motor Show. The Jewel made its debut amongst a horde of other EV startups. But amongst the hordes, the Jewel stood out. Its design was futuristic, but it wasn't cringy. Its tech was cutting edge, but it was realistic. It wasn't just a plaything for the interested wealthy. It was designed from the jump to be industry defining. And let me tell you, people jumped on it. Press across the world salivated over this thing, defining it as the car that was gonna bring us into the new electric age of personal transport. And unfortunately, all this amazing press went to their heads and the plans for the Jewel fundamentally changed. Because of all of this hype, they decided to try and skip the early, slow, mature production stage and go straight into mass production. They wanted to produce 50 thousand cars a year and sell it for a base starting price of 240,000 rand. These were very lofty plans considering the fact they hadn't done things like weather testing or crash safety regulations and a myriad other things to make this car viable for the mass market. Despite all of this, Optimal Energy went ahead trying to create the mass market future that it wanted for itself whilst the wheels were coming off the bus. There are many theories from many, many, many different sources citing why this company failed at this time, but I'm just gonna focus on the most sort of verified concrete theories. Because of the hopes of mass production, the Department of Science and Technology, which had already put 315 million rand of taxpayers' money into the project, moved the project over to the Department of Trade and Industry, which just couldn't see a way to justify the price of going mass production. The price being nine billion rand. Private investment also didn't want to foot this bill, so the Jewel team turned to OEMs like Jaguar Land Rover to try and get them to help invest and share their resources to put this car into production. Unfortunately, Years and years of trying came to absolutely no avail. The EV market just was not big enough at the time to justify this kind of investment. Just to put it into perspective, the mass market competitor to the Jewel was the Nissan Leaf, which was based on the Nissan Tida. It was coming from a really big established company who had money to burn, and it was based on an existing car, meaning that it was cheaper. This car was only doing half of what the Jewel wanted to get to. There was just no way this was gonna make sense. After years of trying, in 2012, Optimal Energy shut down and the Jewel project was canceled, breaking the hearts of so many South Africans and people around the world who believed in this small EV transporter that was gonna change the future of motoring. Ultimately, only four prototypes of the Jewel were ever produced and they were donated to the Nelson Mandela Metro University for education and research purposes. With a fifth body shell currently sitting in the James Hall Museum of Transport. And this could have been the end of the story if it wasn't for Daily Maverick because they did a follow-up on these cars and found out a very sad truth. During a tuition protest in 2023, a parking lot was set alight and three of the four prototypes were razed to the ground, leaving only their bare shells to survive. And the fourth prototype is left in basically disarray. The only photo we have is this one, and 
it's not looking good, bruv. And this is basically all we have left of the Jewel project. And I feel quite weird telling this story because I generally try to be quite optimistic in these videos. I love South African motoring. I love South African motoring history. And there was something really special happening with Jewel. They were bucking the trend and trying to create real mass market change amongst South African motoring. Can you imagine how cool it would be if we had an OEM South African brand and a brand that was creating a product that most car companies are still trying to do today. You could probably argue that the Jewel failed because it was so uncompromising, it, because it was going for this unbelievably unrealistic future. But think about if they had lasted two, three, five more years and BMW or Ford who were coming out with their EV products then in the mid 2010s decided to partner with Joule and use their technology to create things like the i3. Joule could have survived and become a real player in a way that like Rivian is currently. It could have been amazing. Anyway, I don't want this to be a negative story. I don't want this to be a story of failure. I want this to be seen as a story of a group of visionary South Africans who were really trying to make a difference. A group that dared to do and took it to the giants of the motoring industry, making them really take notice. And they almost got there. They were so close. So I think it's fair to say that I speak on behalf of all South Africans when I say thank you Optimal Energy and thank you to the team that produced the jewel because you let us dream of not only an electric future, which may be controversial at the moment, but you let us dream of South Africa having a car brand that we could be proud of. And I really hope that you guys are not the last ones to attempt to make that a reality.